Coming up on DTNS, Trisha Hirschberger shows off for Pixel 6 and 3D printer houses take over Austin, Texas. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 26th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Trapolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And we're very happy to have TV host and streamer Trisha Hirschberger back on the show. Welcome back, Trisha. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for bringing your Pixel 6. I can't wait to look at it. Yes, it's so fun. We were just talking about uh, Trisha's experience with Apple products, <laughs> as well as showing off my new uh, MacBook Pro with the M1 chip. Uh, if you want that, get the longer show, Good Day Internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. We want to give a big thank you to our top patrons uh, over at on Patreon, Jeff Wilkes, Paul Reese, and Dr. X17. Thank you so much. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Adobe announced versions of Photoshop and Illustrator for the web. Now, these versions are limited compared to its other apps, but they're meant to let users open and view work and add comments and feedback. Uh, there's some basic editing tools, though, if you need to do some minor tweaks and quick edits. Adobe also announced that the full version of Photoshop is adding NFT-related features. Content credentials, as they call it, will let you link your Adobe ID with a crypto wallet so that participating marketplaces, like places like OpenSea, can show verification of the art's source. The option to prepare as NFT will come to Photoshop in preview by the end of the month. Content credentials can also be used to show where edits were made and tag stock images. We're going to talk a little more about all those Adobe announcements with Scott Johnson on Wednesday's episode of DTNS. Palm is back, as if they ever left our hearts, launching wireless earbuds. The Palm Buds Pro were designed by former employees from Beats by Dre and Samsung and have active noise canceling and studio-grade audio and enhanced bass. Pre-orders are open today for $129, shipping November 9th, alongside a $15 case. So no, don't stick your fingers, stick your palm in your ear. <laughs> Sure. U.S. President Joe Biden named acting FCC head Jessica Rosenworcel as official head of the agency Tuesday. Her commissioner spot will be filled by co-founder of lobbying group Public Knowledge and FCC special counsel Gigi Sohn. If Sohn is confirmed by the U.S. Senate, the FCC would return to a full five members and avoid frequent ties. Amazon satellite venture Kuiper has teamed with Verizon to expand 4G, LTE, and 5G coverage to remote areas. The company's $10 billion initiative to launch 3,236 low-Earth orbit satellites could provide throughput speeds up to 400 megabits per second. Kuiper expects to launch by 2026. The Aura ring was a, was a big deal in the NBA bubble uh, last year, and Aura has announced its Generation 3 smart ring, adding a pulse oxygen sensor and increasing the number of temperature sensors from 3 to 7. That'll let them add some features, too. The Gen 3 Aura adds the ability to do period tracking, blood oxygen monitoring, and real-time heart rate tracking. The Aura Generation 3 is $299 for pre-order now, shipping November 15th. App service is free for six months with purchase, and then $5.99 a month after. However, if you're upgrading from a previous Aura Ring model, you'll get free lifetime membership. Also, real quickly, we've got uh, earnings rolling in from Microsoft, Twitter, and uh, Alphabet. We'll talk a little more about what we find significant about those on tomorrow's show. But real quickly, ad revenue for YouTube rose 43% on the year to $7 billion, which puts YouTube alone close to Netflix's $7.48 in Q3. All right, let's talk about The Verge getting access to a presentation that shows that Amazon is building a new app codenamed Project Mike, as in microphone, M-I-C. It would let anyone make and distribute a live radio-like show, including playing music pulled from Amazon's catalog. Listeners would be able to choose to tune into shows through a Project Mike app or in Audible, Amazon Music, Twitch, or on your Alexa-enabled devices. People listening on one of those last like say an Echo, could potentially call in and interact with the show by voice. Project Mike app would be optimized for use in the car, apparently. Uh, while music would be a main focus of the content, obviously, the presentation indicated three main categories, uh, pop culture, comedy, and sports. Rich, I know <laughs> you, like me, have an inordinate love of radio, and this got you very excited. Yeah, I mean, I've been involved with community radio here in Cleveland for for a number of years, going back to my college days. And 
like part of the the joy of that is having the ability to create shows like this. Now there are all sorts of uh, restrictions when it comes to this. Like it, you know, the the licenses that radio stations have to carry are very much still geared for live performances. You can send it out over the internet, you know, depending on you know what kind of license you have with the FCC and and that kind of stuff. But you know, having any kind of archive of that, if I want to share that with someone that can't listen, you know, when I have my silly radio show on from 6 to 8 a.m. or something like that on a Sunday, like that doesn't want to tune in in that crazy early hour. I'm kind of out of luck uh, unless I want to get into dubious legal territory. So having something like this, I actually thought Spotify would be the first company to kind of come in on this where you can, you know, it seemed like they were building all the pieces with a lot of live audio uh, uh, stuff that you could kind of maybe throw into playlists. This seems like, you know, Amazon has the idea of we want to be the new radio and we want to enable radio creators. I'm very excited about this. The only thing that makes me sad is this might impact uh, the success of other college and community radio stations, which are near and dear to my heart, uh, if this takes off with the youth. But like the idea of this gets me very excited for a bunch of very, very silly radio shows that I've had in my brain for many years. And Spotify might still beat them to it. This is just a leaked presentation, right? This yeah. is not a product announcement. Trisha, you know, as somebody who also streams on Twitch like we do, do you see any opportunities or excitement in this? Yeah, it's so interesting to me. When I first heard this news story um, and first read about it, my immediate thought was, oh, so podcasts, but live. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, if you have the uh, the video on demand or the audio on demand later, then it's, you know, then then it essentially yeah. is a podcast that was recorded live, which is very cool and people can call into. But when you talk about it in terms of radio, then it really gets the wheels thinking. I have not ever produced radio content. I have immense respect for people that do. I think it's so cool. Um, but then I'm like, oh, man, do you need to have 24-hour content around the clock so that if people – tune into your radio station via Amazon, will there be something new to listen to? Or is it essentially more like a, a three to six hour live recorded podcast? Um, so for me, because I, I have never really worked in radio, I'm finding it a little hard to wrap my brain around. Um, but I do think that it's cool. And I mean, live is where we've seen pre-recorded was all the rage. Now it's live. Um, same thing with, you know, Twitter live streaming, like everyone has their live streaming. So why not? Why not here? Yeah, that that's really interesting. The presentation, according to The Verge, did touch a little bit on discovery and being able to look look by genre for things. But I wonder, could you have a favorites list that you're like, oh, th these are the people like on Twitch with rebroadcasts. Like these are the people I want you to put on live when they're live. So if I get in my car, I can just turn on Project <laughs> Mike. And it'll always have one of my favorites, whoever happens to be live. Because, because yeah, I don't think people are going to be going 24-7. They're just going to be going for their, like you say, their couple of hours or so. Uh, yeah, and be if, very curious what it ends And up if this could vault Amazon, you know, they've kind of been the quiet, I guess, third place for the infotainment race when you're looking at third parties behind uh, Apple and Google. Um, you know, they do have some partnership with brands and stuff like that. If they could bring this in, roll this in either as an app or as a dedicated, you know, on their Alexa infotainment stuff integration that they have with a number of car makers, um, you know, that, that could be a huge draw too. And and back to your point, Trisha, podcasters could use this. I could absolutely see streaming daily tech news show into something like this. Uh, I guess has the comedy? No, the sports? No, uh, I don't know. They'd have to give us a category. But, but yeah, uh, I'm curious to see uh, if, if this ever does get launched, what, what it ends up being. I, I will probably try it. All right, well, moving on in some cool uh, uh, home technology, home building technology, the home builder Lenner Corporation is partnering with a startup called Icon to build a community of 100 3D printed homes near Austin, Texas. Icon has built 3D printed homes before, but it usually is one at a time. It recently built 10 two-bedroom houses in Tabasco, Mexico. This will be its most ambitious development yet, however, because, I mean, just we, 100 houses, that's more than 10. The U.S. has had a housing shortage for years, in part because of construction labor shortage that existed pre-pandemic. I can't imagine those have gotten any better. Supply chain problems have then slowed things down even more. Freddie Mac estimates the U.S. has a national housing deficit of about 3.8 million units. Instead of using wood frames, the Icon houses are 3D printed concrete frames. A 15 and a half foot tall printer can print the exterior and interior walls, uh, a wall system of a 2,000 square foot one-story house 
in about a week. And that's the same as about a wood frame and drywall uh, a typical housing situation. The 3D printed homes also require fewer people on site and waste less material. Icon estimates a home can be printed with one or two people on the printer system and one or two on the materials delivery end as well. So, I mean, you know, talking four people kind of max there, which is kind of interesting. The foundation must be poured for printing begins and the roof windows and other finishings are added by conventional means afterwards. So it's not, you know, you're not getting a whole home with just four people, but still uh, uh, gets you quite a bit of the way there. The uh, Icon's Vulcan 3D printer works on site to exude the concrete of the home. The operator receives basic training and uses a tablet to control the operation. It can be remotely monitored and print at night or in low light conditions with onboard lighting. Icon says it's run as many as three printers at a time in one location. Uh, Icon isn't the only company pursuing 3D printed homes, however. We've certainly covered some uh, on DTNS itself. Uh, Mighty Buildings plans to build a 15-lot community in the Coachella Valley in California next year. And SQ4D is printing homes in Long Island. Uh, but super interesting kind of uses. And when I first, you know, just, just kind of hearing about this, not seeing kind of the pictures of that company, I was like, okay, is this going to be just like a brutalist nightmare? Like, just like, you, you think concrete, I don't know. Cinder like, block, Soviet yeah. era you, concrete You think block. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 70 block, 70s block of flats or something like that. But no, I mean, these are, these look uh, like pretty typical homes. You can, because it's 3D printed, you can, uh, uh, I, I believe, customize like different components of it. Uh, uh, and it has a, a very organic, almost like a, kind of like an Adobe, Adobe, whatever kind of feel to it. Trisha, you want to live in a printed house? I mean, yes. Uh, I think my <laughs> first thought with this is 3D printing takes forever. So it wasn't until Rich, you said that sometimes they'll use as many as three printers in one location uh, that I was like, oh, I guess this could be feasible. But I mean, if it is less waste and if there are less people on site, maybe it's a more affordable way to create housing. And, you know, given the state of the homeless in this country in particular, it would be lovely to be able to put more people in safe homes. So if we can use technology to do that, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a, a conversation to be had about displacing jobs and that kind of, you know, it, it, those kind of issues as well. Um, but I, I like using tech to help people. So if this is indeed using tech to help people, I'm all for it. And I think 3D printing is awesome. I will eat 3D printed food. I will live in a 3D printed house. I am on it. What about you, Tom? 3D printed house with a 3D printer in it to print my food. Yes. Sign yeah. me up. Absolutely. <laughs> and and real quick, I, I admitted that. I, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, Trisha, you mentioned about, you know, the impact on jobs, but if we need, if there's a 3.8 million home shortage, all, you know, if we can print those homes at a cheaper rate, there's uh, a construction need, worker yeah, shortage. We still need people to pour that to foundation to, that. to put all those finishing is to do the roofing and stuff like that. So theoretically it could also, you know, yeah. at least so, to fill this gap, create jobs for sure. I, I point out that Rich, Rich, Rich did say, say this, like we don't have enough people, even before the pandemic, we didn't have enough people to build houses. So, so this is at least an industry that I think benefits uh, from from being able to do it with fewer people, and uh, I, I the Wall Street Journal pointed out that so far the homes have sold for a little less than what a, an equivalent house would sell. Not a lot though. They expect to get market rates for this, but I think the key is what you said, Tricia, about providing affordable housing on purpose, right? Not just making houses in general cheaper, but they have worked with nonprofits in other parts of the world to print houses for people. And, and if you could get organizations to team up with them uh, on this, that that could be a, a huge thing, you know, Habitat for Humanity. We all love seeing Jimmy Carter out there, you know, hammering nails at his, his age. It's an inspiration, <laughs> but how cool would it be if he's on the tablet working the yeah. printer too, right? You know? I love it. I'm all for it. All right. We promise not to let Facebook papers story eat up too much time on this show, uh, but there is a lot to sort through out there. So here's a little follow up to yesterday's coverage. Uh, Restofworld.org reviewed re the reporting that indicates Facebook underinvests in the global south. That's that's a term for uh, countries in South America, Africa, uh, India. One example was how Facebook took years to add speakers of Amaric and Oromo uh, to battle abuses related to Facebook use in Ethiopia and the Tigray region. Uh, Facebook began operations in India in 2006, but did not develop algorithms to moderate speech in Hindi and Bengali until 2018 and 2020, respectively. Uh, there are also examples of a lack of native language speakers and algorithms for moderating content in Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, and Syria. A December 2020 post from one Facebook team said its integrity system, quote, doesn't work 
in much of the world. And that's because the algorithms and the, the people don't speak the languages. There are also examples of making exceptions to moderation and deference to state actors, both in India and Vietnam. All right. One more Facebook paper thing. Big technology newsletter got their hands on some documents and noted a report on a test where Facebook turned off the ranking algorithm for the news feed for 0.5% of Facebook users. What they found may surprise you. Engagement dropped, you might expect. Content from groups rose to the top. Maybe you would have guessed that. But ad revenue rose as users had to scroll through more posts to find things of interest. And Facebook decided not to do this. You may think, well, money-grubbing Facebook, they wanted more ad revenue, right? They wanted engagement. They, they actually prioritized engagement among simple revenue there, which I thought was an interesting find. On the company's earnings call yesterday, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg addressed, quote, the recent debate around our company, saying, what we are seeing is a coordinated effort to selectively use leaked documents to paint a false picture. He added, we can't change the underlying media dynamic, but there is a different constituency I serve, and that is people. Man, he always sounds like he's running for office to me. <laughs> um, elsewhere on the earnings call, Zuckerberg said, quote, so much of our services have gotten dialed to be the best for the most people who use them rather than specifically for young adults. So when he says he serves the people, apparently he means young people now. Uh, in fact, Facebook's going to change uh, and focus on young adults over the next few years, even if it means growing slowly in the older demos. Instagram is going to lead the charge by making video, specifically reels, more central to its experience. And Facebook announced that in the future, it will announce earnings for an app-based division, which includes Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger, and separately for its Reality Labs division, which is augmented reality and VR efforts. That includes the Reality Labs itself, which does research as well as Oculus and future metaverse uh, developments. Reality Labs is expected to reduce operating profit by $10 billion this year. It'll cost the company $10 billion this year as it focuses on developing and building that metaverse concept. Total expenses for Facebook could rise by as much as $27 billion next year. Zuckerberg indicated he wants the company to increase revenue from marketplace activities as opposed to ad revenue. Uh, the metaverse would be a way to do that. You could see people selling digital clothes, digital tools, digital experiences uh, that Facebook, of course, would take a cut of. Uh, so, so Tricia, I, I don't know if any part of this in particular you, you want to comment on first, but I'm, I'm curious what you think of this whole metaverse thing in particular. Uh, I mean, honestly, <clears throat> I'll tell you, Facebook is not my favorite platform and has not been my favorite platform for a while. If I did not need it for my Oculus 2 and I did not need it to keep in touch with my aunts and uncles that live in other parts of the country, I would have deleted my Facebook a while ago. Now, Instagram, on the other hand, I am an avid user of. Um, so when it comes to Facebook and the metaverse, I, I always feel like anytime I hear uh, Zuckerberg speak, I also feel like he's running a little bit for office and I filter out like everything he says, I pour through a coffee filter and I feel <laughs> like I only I only take little snippets from it. You, so, you have a personal Chemex for Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so I have kind of largely ignored a lot of what uh, Zuckerberg has said about, you know, creating the Facebook metaverse, if you will, um, and kind of focused on the areas that I find most usable. It is interesting that you said about the um, the test that Facebook ran to turn off the ranking algorithm for the news feed, that they only did it for half of 1% of users. And then to me, who is someone who, you know, was like, do away with the algorithms, show me things in, in order of how they were posted. I want to see a wider breadth of things. Um, I understand that that does not prioritize keeping people very engaged on the platform. And it's, it is interesting that they chose engagement over money, but I completely understand why they did it because they want you sucked in and only using that. Um, it, to me, it seems very kind of end of worldy evil villain. Um, but you know, that's where we are. Rich, how do you feel about it? Uh, well, the, on, on the, uh, uh, the uh, under investing in the global south. I mean, language is incredibly hard. Like we, we've seen this for platforms that seemingly are focused on English speakers. And like the idea that if you didn't have native language speakers informing how your algorithms like like sort out for content, like just imagine if for 
for like American English, you had something that was a year out of date and trying to like stay on top of moderating content like that, it would, you, you would very easily fall through the cracks. So I, I could definitely see that. Uh, the, the thing that stands out to me is this, in, uh, you know, very clearly uh, uh, potentially setting up for this, um, you know, kind of alphabet style model that Facebook may be pursuing uh, going forward for their governance. Uh, $10 billion, uh, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, the metaverse, obviously, uh, not shying away from from investment there. I know 10 billion is, I don't know how much that is, if that's couch cushions or if that's, you know, the piggy bank for Facebook, but uh, that's that's still a lot of money for, for any kind of investment uh, going forward. So uh, uh, putting their money uh, where their VR mouths are, I don't know how that works. Their virtual <laughs> mouth is, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, well, folks, uh, you might be thinking right now, I have an additional piece of information I would like to contribute to that conversation they're having, uh, but I don't know what their email address is. Well, it's feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Now you know, and you can send us an email. Google has an eight minute plus ad for its Pixel 6 up on YouTube with 113 reasons. And I and I, I didn't watch the whole thing in order, but I fast forwarded to make sure, yes, they actually do cite 113 reasons to switch to the Pixel. Quote, when the maker of your old phone stops making phones, a clear bit of shade thrown on LG, which you may remember announced back in April, it was closing its mobile uh, business unit. Ouch, Google. Uh, so how good is this phone really? Well, Trisha got her Pixel 6 Pro. Uh, so Trisha, let's get your thoughts on the not only the phone, but the new Android 12 uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, what do you think of the Pixel 6 Pro so far? So far, I'm really liking it. There's some stuff. Um, I Just so you know, my normal daily drivers before this were the Pixel 5 and a uh, Samsung Note 20 Ultra. And I carry both of them around for different reasons. Uh, what I like about the Pixels is the stripped down Android UI. It's amazing. Um, but yes, I have the Pixel 6 Pro here. I have a little case on it. So I will say the camera bar across the back of it has not been... Um, as noticeable as I think some people were concerned about, right? Um, the case kind of makes it not quite flush, but a little bit more flush. Um, the phone looks really nice. It does have the curved edge display on it, which the Note 20 Ultra also has this. And I'll be honest, that is not one of my favorite features. Aesthetically, it looks really nice, but I find myself, because I have small hands, I think, uh -huh. accidentally pressing the sides of the keyboard when I go to do things with my hand. It's not my favorite. Um, the fingerprint sensor is fast. I can show everybody here. Uh, if you are watching this in video and if you're listening to it, I'll explain you what I'm doing. But you can see uh, right here, you just you have this little fingerprint icon. You just put your finger right there and it opens right up for you. You can see that the uh, the notifications uh, in the notification quick task bar that you pull down are a lot more blocky. They're a lot more big and kind of cartoony now, um, which it's still taking me some time to get used to. I'll be perfectly honest. I'm a fan of having everything condensed so that I can see it at one glance as opposed to kind of large and cartoony and requiring me to swipe through it. But there's a lot of new tech on this phone that I do really like. I love that I can wireless charge my buds just on the back mm -hmm. of it uh, by turning on battery sharing. That's really nice for a lot of the hosting jobs that I do. I'll use these buds as my IFB. And so being able to charge them very easily and quickly at my desk is awesome. I've also found that I can, um, if I put my new Pixel 6 Pro on the Pixel stand for wireless charging. I can have it stand up and I've had it, I have it now set to automatically go into do not disturb mode. Ah. But you can choose certain contacts that can break through that. So for example, if I'm Twitch streaming, I don't wanna know if I have a spam caller calling me, but I might wanna know if my husband is calling me or my son's daycare um, to you know pause my stream and be able to go to that. Now, instead of just turning my phone on silent and hoping that I would happen to see it, uh, I have a way to allow just certain important things to break through. That's really cool. Um, I'm someone who uh, looks at my phone a lot in bed. I, I will say it's very, very sad, but I'm a side sleeper. So I do this a lot and you would <laughs> not believe how much auto rotate drives me nuts on the yeah. regular. Uh, the Pixel 6 Pro uses facial detection. If you turn it on oh. with your auto rotate to keep your phone uh, situated in the right way for you while you're looking at it. So that's been lovely. So there's a lot of little things like that that I'm finding that I'm like, oh, this is new tech. It's either Android 12 specific or Pixel 6 Pro specific. 
that I'm really finding enjoyable and an enhancement over the Pixel 5 I was using before. But mostly, I mean, I love the stripped down Android UI. I absolutely adore it. That's what I'm there for. I mean, I started my, cre my career in content creation years and years ago on YouTube. So I was in the Google ecosystem very early. It's not weird for me to use Google Docs or Google Drive. Like that's, that's the ecosystem I'm in. So it makes total sense to me. Um, I don't know. I, have either of you had any questions about it or had a chance to get hands on with it? I, I've got one question in particular because I'm, I'm a big fan of the fingerprint on the back that they used to have on the Pixel. They had it on the Nexus. Mm -hmm. I actually kind of like the, the way the Duo does it on the side. Uh, so I'm curious, since they moved it to the front, how that affects the display? Because I know Google did a lot to try to make sure it would not affect the display. What are you seeing now when you when you look at that area that has the fingerprint underneath the screen? Uh, I honestly see no difference. It doesn't look like it affects. So you're not noticing it at all. That's good. At all, not even a little tiny bit. I'm looking at it. I just turned the brightness up to full right now, and I'm looking at it from like every angle with it locked and everything. And yeah, I mean, the only time, so it shows you visibly where it is when you're on the lock screen, so you know your thumb's hitting the correct spot. Um, I also miss the back fingerprint sensor. Mm -hmm. I love the back fingerprint sensor. Um, but I mean, so far, this is very quick. It's very responsive. It doesn't affect the display at all. The display is beautiful. Um, it has that nice 120 hertz display available if you need it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been pretty good for me so far. I, I mean, I'm still, you know, whenever you get a new phone, there's going to be things that you just muscle memory are going to have to adjust and adapt mm -hmm. to. So that's kind of the phase I'm still in right now. The only thing that I don't love so far about the fingerprint on the front is a, I'm automatically going to the back because I'm used to it, but also sure. B, if you don't get the fingerprint sensor right the first time, it automatically pops up the pin and then I can't try the fingerprint again. Oh, yeah. Whereas when it was on the back, even if it popped up to enter your pin, you could just keep trying it until it yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So that's okay. that's that's been a little bit of a pain point for me. Um, yeah. I might from, just be able to lock the screen again and try it again, but still that's an extra step you'd have to take. So from the very important perspective of taking pictures of kids, specifically yeah. your children, uh, I, that is like the main reason I bought my phone was like, I just needed to, be able to take pictures of the kids. Uh, Google's been billing this as like, you know, the biggest jump for a pixel camera in a while. Does it, is it a noticeable jump from the five coming, you know, from that generation or, or compared to the note too? I'm just curious what's, what's been your experience with that? Um, there are some new features that are especially nice. Uh, if mm -hmm. you're looking like if you, if you have a child who's constantly on the move and doesn't pose for pictures, which mine <laughs> definitely is. There are specific modes you can set it up and uh, using artificial intelligence, the camera software will attempt to uh, clear out your child's face. I haven't had a lot of uh, success messing with that yet, but I mean, Night Sight is, I would say, at least as good, if not better, than it was on the Pixel 5 um, as far as, you know, looking at your your night mode and that kind of stuff. I, I went on a, uh, I went out to dinner with my husband for our wedding anniversary this past weekend. Oh, and mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And was playing with the camera a little bit uh, out that night. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far it's pretty good. The big thing for me with the camera on the Note 20 Ultra, honestly, and this sounds like the silliest thing, but is having the S Pen as a remote shutter. I know uh, I can just buy a remote shutter for the Pixel 6 Pro. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that I can do that, but they're not, usually the ones you can buy are a little bulky and kind of hard to hide in photos. Whereas that S Pen is just so tiny. It's so easy to hide if you need to. Um, so uh, that's always nice. And then of course the Samsung always has extra like uh, soft filters and such to make your face look nicer on a day you don't have makeup on and all that kind of stuff. That is uh, that's helpful as well. Sometimes, if you're if you haven't had that cup of coffee in the morning, <laughs> that can help you out. Um, now, I haven't messed around too much with uh, with the pixels beautification features, if you will, but they do have portrait light, which is really cool. I don't know if you've messed with portrait light at all, but again, that's something you could also have on the Pixel Five, and it's kind of in the Google suite of photo editing. A lot of this being software based, it's nice because it can just come within your Google Photos and you're yeah, editing yeah. within Google Photos. Um, I like the fact that the new camera on the 6 Pro uh, takes in so much more light. So hopefully you're gonna get a lot more accurate uh, color uh, as well. But it's it's still definitely in testing mode for me. I don't know that the 6 Pro has completely replaced my Note 20 Ultra as far as my main content capturing phone. 
Mm -hmm. We'll see if it does. Um, I'll probably put some direct side-by-side -side photo comparisons on my Instagram at some point this week. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to see how it stacks up. But as far as taking pictures of kids, um, that, that is where, you know, Google is saying we've made this software specifically to make your life easier so that even if you're not a professional photographer, you can take pictures like you are. That's great. That's great. Like, like, uh, like Trish said, go, go follow her everywhere. Uh, specifically Instagram, if you want to see the photos, uh, and check that out real quickly before we wrap up, uh, Glenn Keeler emailed in with a, uh, project that will force your Facebook into chronological order. They have a Patreon. It's socialfixer.com. So, uh, I don't know, Tricia, maybe that, that might, mm -hmm. uh, that might fix things. You might try it out. I'm into it. I'm yeah. into it. Thank you, Glenn. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And we wanted to thank our brand new bosses, Hagenator and Nikhil Perchur, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Hagenator and Nikhil. Man, I thought we'd get one new boss today. We got two. Thank Double duty. Both. That's amazing. Also, thank you, Trisha Hirschberger. Again, if folks want to keep up with not only your Pixel 6 adventures, but all your adventures, where should they go? Oh man, uh, well thank you guys so much for having me. This has been so very fun. If you wanna follow what I'm up to, you can find me at that GRL Trish, uh, so that girl Trish without the I and the girl, um, on Instagram, Twitter, and yes, also Facebook, um, or at Trisha Hirschberger on YouTube and Twitch. I'm most active probably on Twitch, so come on over and hang out live if you like gameplay. I play a lot of indies, and uh, I try to introduce people to game devs they might not have heard of yet. Yeah, if you watch our Good Day Internet Twitch channel, sometimes after we're done, we just send you right over to Trisha's channel. It's easy. It's true, and I am yeah. always so appreciative for that. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it, yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson, in particular, talking about those Adobe announcements. We'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>